Hey, what's going on everybody? It's ETA Prime back here again. Today we're going to be taking a look at an inexpensive prepaid phone that I recently picked up from Walmart. And one of the main reasons I wanted to get this was for emulation. And I can tell you right now, for the price, this thing is a great performer. This is the AT&T Radiant Max 5G. And this is going for $119 right now, I guess, for a pre-Black Friday sale. They had a bunch of them in stock at my local store, so I figured I'd go ahead and pick one up. This is a prepaid or pay-as-you-go phone, and I know some of the Boost Mobile and Verizon phones do ask you to activate the phone after a certain amount of time, or they even cut off Wi-Fi. But what I did with this was I pulled the SIM card out of it before I even booted it up, and it's been running for six days. Now, I can't promise you anything, but I have not activated this unit yet. These cheaper phones are getting more powerful as time goes on, and with this one here, I haven't had any performance issues. It'll even run Call of Duty Mobile and Genshin Impact at low settings. But the real reason I picked it up was for emulation, and this thing will actually do some GameCube games at full speed. Now before we jump into the testing, I did want to give you a quick rundown on the specs here. For the CPU, we have an 8-core MediaTek Dimensity 700, we have two A76 cores running at 2.2GHz, and six A55 cores running at 2GHz. The GPU is the Mali G57 MC2, we get 4GB of LPDDR4 RAM. 64 gigabytes of internal storage plus a micro SD card slot, good up to a 512 gigabyte card. A 6.82 inch IPS display at 720 by 1640. Not the highest resolution, but it is an IPS and it's not bad for the price. We also have a 4,750 milliamp hour battery, and this is running Android 11 right out of the box. But before we move any further, I do want to mention that this video is sponsored by Ugreen and their all-new GANX 100 watt wall charger. With three USB Type-C ports and a single Type-A port, you can basically get all of your devices charged at one time, and up to 100 watts out of this charger. In the past, I never gave this much thought, but the included chargers that come with your devices are really, really slow. They're low-end chargers. The new GANX does up to 100 watts altogether out of all four ports, or if you have a device that supports it, you can use the top two USB-C ports and get 100 watts out of those. Now when it comes to the other ports on the GANX, the USB-C number 3 port will do 22 watts, and the USB-A will also do 22 watts, but the top two, as you can see here, will output up to 100 watts. In the beginning, I was a little skeptical about this charger, but I did run some tests on it, and I kind of wanted to show you what I got out of this thing. So what I have here is a kilowatt meter with the GANX plugged into it. We'll go with the M1 MacBook. This will do 50 watts. Next up, I'm gonna plug in my Google Pixel 6 Pro. And finally, we have the Red Magic 5S. Both of these phones do Qualcomm quick charging, and if we take a look at the wattage being pulled from the wall using the GANX charger, this actually jumps up to over 100 watts. If we give it a second for everything to equalize out, and like I mentioned, if you have a device that will support 100 watt quick charging, the top two USB ports can be utilized specifically for that device. So if you're looking for a high quality wall charger for all of your devices, I will leave a link to the Ugreen GANX in the description. I've been having an absolute blast with emulation on this device, but the one issue I've run into is finding a controller that'll fit this thing. It's got that 6.82 inch screen, so even the Sataki won't fit. But if you're dead set on a telescopic controller, it will fit the IPEGA 9086. It'll also fit the new MGX. But unfortunately, I just can't get this to fit in any of my USB Type-C controllers like the Razer Kishi. It's just such a large device. So I opted for an Xbox controller and a phone clip. You can get these phone clips for pretty cheap. The one I have here is a little higher end. It's the 8-bit-o phone clip for the Xbox controller, but it does have a lot of adjustability, and that's one of the main reasons I personally like this clip here. I'm not a huge fan of having my phone. I'm not a huge fan of having my device above the controller like this, but it does work out, and if you have an adjustable clip like this, you can actually make it pretty comfortable. Another thing I did, just to make it a little easier to use this device in landscape mode, was install an Android TV launcher from Google Play. This is the Pro version, but as you can see here, I have all of my apps that I'm going to be using on this device listed right here. I can use my controller to easily navigate to them. And yeah, that's basically how I have this device set up. I've also got a 128GB micro SD card, and now it's time to get into some testing because I really want you to see how this thing performs. First up, we'll go with some Sega Saturn. I'm using the standalone version of Yoba San Shiro, and I'm actually really impressed here. I also tried the Retro Arch Core of Yoba San Shiro. Unfortunately, I didn't have much luck with it, but the standalone version does run Sega Saturn at full speed. Here's Sega Rally. I also tested a few more games and didn't have any issues using the standalone version of Yoba San Shiro, so when it comes down to it, yes, this device can run Sega Saturn games quite well.
Next up, we got some N64. I'm using the standalone version of MooPen64 plus FZ from the Google Play Store. Conker's Bad Fur Day, 800 by 600. I just set the phone down to make it a little easier to record, but we definitely have enough power to run N64 games on this. Moving over to Dreamcast using the ReDream emulator, we're at 1280 by 960. Dreamcast isn't going to present an issue. I mean, when it comes to this ReDream emulator, I've had really good luck on lower end devices, and with that 2.2 gigahertz CPU, as long as the game's compatible with the emulator, it's going to run it just fine. Moving over to some PSP using the standalone version of PPSSPP, Vulcan Backend, 3X Resolution, Tekken 6. Not the hardest one to run, but it does present an issue on some lower end devices. But as you can see here, we're at 60. Here's Chains of Olympus. This is a harder one to emulate, especially on lower end devices. I did have to drop this down to 2x resolution in the PPSSPP emulator, but we're still using that Vulcan back in. Even Chains of Olympus and Ghost of Sparta are playable on this $120 device. And since I was here, I wanted to throw one more PSP game at it just to see how it performed. Here we have Midnight Club, and in my experience, this is actually harder to emulate than the God of War games. We're at 2x resolution, Vulcan back in, and this is running absolutely amazing. I mean, it's really great to see these super budget devices running PSP at full speed. And the final thing I wanted to show off in this video was some GameCube games running. Now, don't get me wrong, this will not run every single GameCube game at full speed, but if you're using a correct build of Dolphin MMJR, I recently did a video on it, you can get a lot of these easier to emulate games running really well on this device. I'd say this is really impressive given the price of this device here. I got a couple more GameCube games to test, and keep in mind I am using Dolphin MMJR. Smash, running great. Every once in a while I do notice a few stutters here and there, and I really do think that this is just the shaders in the background. It really happens when there's lots of effects on screen, but another one I wanted to test was Sunshine. So we're past the first little tutorial level, we're in the plaza, and this originally ran at 30fps on GameCube hardware, that's what we have here. You can patch this on PC and higher end Android devices to run at 60, but I don't think this little device will hit 60. But it still plays great at 30fps. So in the end, I think we're getting some really impressive results out of this cheaper Android phone. At $120, I do think it would be worth it if you need a secondary device and you know exactly what you're getting into. N64, Dreamcast, PSP, Sega Saturn, you want to do some DS or anything underneath that, Neo Geo, SNES, NES, it's going to run flawlessly on this device. It's not going to compete with something like the Snapdragon 855 and the Galaxy S10, and this really isn't going to do 3DS and the higher-end GameCube games. But at a $120 price tag, if you're looking for a secondary Android device that you can play your favorite retro games on, I do think this would be worth it. And keep in mind, we also have access to Google Play. This will do Call of Duty Mobile, it'll do Genshin Impact at low settings, and if you want to do some cloud gaming like GeForce Now, Stadia, or Xbox game streaming, this does have AC Wi-Fi built in. I'm just really happy to see these more powerful phones being released for much cheaper on the prepaid market. We were stuck with the dual core and quad core Snapdragons for so long. Just uh, getting one of these MediaTek Dimensity 700s in these cheaper phones is really, really awesome. Before I end this video, I did want to show you some benchmarks that I ran. That way you can kind of compare it to the device you have right now. First up, Geekbench 5 single core 589, multi 1658. Moving over to Wildlife, this is a Vulcan benchmark for the GPU. 1,096, and finally we have Antutu with a total score of 233,279. Comparing this to a more powerful device, even with something like a Snapdragon 845, it doesn't have a chance in benchmarks, but as you saw, emulation does work well on this Dimensity. So in conclusion, I do think it's worth $120 if you're looking for a secondary device for emulation or even just some native Android gaming or cloud stream. If you're interested, if you're interested in learning more, maybe pick one of these up. I will leave a link in the description. I'm also going to leave a link down there to the phone clip I'm using in this video. But that's it for this one. And like always, thanks for watching.